We're going to do this presentation about how to debug TensorFlow programs. We're going to focus specifically on TF2 because TF2 is a stable uh, release and it will have it will have long-term support going forward. But there are also places where we're going to mention um, TF1, and when we do, we'll make that clear, so you know which version of TensorFlow we're talking about. So first of all, I want to define the scope of debugging. And the reason why I need to do this is because the word debugging is an overloaded term in machine learning. Different people use it to mention or to, to refer to um, different things, sometimes in confusing ways. So in the scope of um, this talk, debugging refers to specific things Really that have um, that many have to do with the correctness of your TensorFlow program, like mathematical implementation bugs. For example, when you when you are implementing a new layer type or a new loss function, <clears throat> you, you may run into D-type issues or shape issues, or just straight bugs in the math. And uh, the techniques we'll cover will also be useful for debugging the pre-processing and the post-processing parts of your TensorFlow program. And uh, one big focus will be the um, debugging of the issues like NAND and Infinity in your models, which happen very frequently during um, TF model training. Um, Nemet will talk about a specific tool called Tensor Tracer, which is very useful for catching the root cause of NANDs and infinities on TPUs and other devices. And uh, um, we're not going to talk about how to debug um, bugs in pop kernels themselves or um, bugs in hardware, because um, it's more specific to the hardware um, or the op kernel that you're using. However, the methods we'll cover will be useful for you to debug <coughs> models that are affected by those kernel or hardware bugs. At least it will be useful for you to like um, narrow down the cause of the model bug to the level of app kernels or um, hardware. And the um, tools and techniques we'll cover will also be useful um, in case where you, you want to just peek into your model to understand um, what, what, what's going on. And uh, um, so one um, example would be answering a question like, why is my model making a wrong prediction? on a certain input example. So you will be able to like peek into the model and look at the layer activations and the intermediate tensors and answer that question. So one use case um, that's kind of relevant to that is when you're porting model from one version of the library to another, or from one um, library to another, um, like from TensorFlow to TF Lite, or from TensorFlow to um, TFJS, or from TensorFlow to PyTorch, um, or um, from PyTorch to TensorFlow, um, you will often see um, divergence between the two implementations of the same model, and you want to quickly identify the root cause of the um, divergence, and the tools and techniques we'll cover will also be useful for that purpose. What we're not going to cover, um, however, are the debugging cases like um, debugging the model performance and uh, um, looking at the accuracy of models after training, like um, model um, evaluation and um, analysis. We're not going to cover um, how to debug fairness issues in models. Either. Those are also important kinds of um, TensorFlow debugging, but those are outside the scope of this talk. There are great tools for those, like um, some dashboards, intensive boards, and the what-if tool, and the fairness indicator, and so forth. But I'm not going to talk about those here. Any questions so far? OK, so here's a brief outline of this presentation. We're going to talk about how to debug tensor values. We're going to um, talk about how to look at the placement of ops on different devices like CPUs and uh, um, GPUs. It's a very commonly asked question. We're going to look at how to debug the structures of graphs in TensorFlow 2, um, including the graphs from TL functions and uh, graphs that are optimized for the runtime. <clears throat> and then in section four, we're going to cover the special topic of step debugging, which is to use an IDE to step over your code line by line. And then um, in the fifth section, we're going to move from low-level API to high-level um, API. And the specific high-level API I will focus on is TF, um, TF Keras, because TF Keras is the official high-level API in TF2, and also because I'm not that familiar with other um, high-level APIs like Summit and so forth. And in um, section six, we're going to talk about the debugging of numerical issues like NANDs and Infinity. And finally, I'm going to present a tool called TensorFlow debugger, um, including the existing V1 features and the V2 features that we're currently working on. So first, let's take a look, take a look at, at how to debug tensor values. So here's a very simple example. So it's very straightforward. You are not decorating your functions with TF function decorator, so everything is executed eagerly in TF2. And there you can simply use the print statement to look at the values of tensors, like in this simple example here. So Y is an eager tensor, if you do print, it will see the value um, in the step out printout. So it's very similar to print the value of NumPy arrays, with a caveat that if the tensor lives on the GPU, then printing it will involve um, copying from the GPU to your host, which may be a little bit costly. 
And uh, oftentimes when the size of the tensor is too big, you probably don't want to look at the entire tensor because there are going to be millions of elements. What you sometimes want is to do um, a reduce operation on the tensor and then look at some numerical summaries of the tensor, like what's the minimum value, what's the maximum value, and what's the mean. It's also a useful technique. That's fully supported in eager mode. So eager tensors string and wrapper methods use NumPy under the hood, which means that you can use the set print option function from NumPy to control the details of how the values of tensors are printed. For instance, if you use um, the precision PO arguments, you can adjust basically how many decimal points are printed in the float type tensors. You can also adjust like the threshold element counts beyond which um, ellipses will be used in the printing, um, which is useful for cases where you want to look at the values of huge tensors, like thousands of elements. <coughs> of course, um, story is not um, always as straightforward um, as this. The program is often not executing purely eagerly, and sometimes you have tier functions. Um, sometimes your function is decorated by TensorFlow itself um, and converted into a graph. So there, if you use the print statement, then the result of the printing may not be what you, you um, expect. So here, the user intends to look at the value of n at each iteration of the while loop. So the user puts a um, print statement here naively, and uh, um, the result is only one printed line, um, even though the while loop is executed multiple times. And the contents of the printed text is also kind of confusing to a naive user. And the reason is that um, when TF function is used, the code here is transformed into a TF graph. And the print statement is executed during that um, function to graph transformation. And the content you see here is actually um, a node in the graph instead of the, the value of the tensor at runtime. So the curved approach here is to use TF print. So TF print will modify the graph. It will actually um, add a couple of nodes to the graph so you can look at the value of the n inside um, the TF function. So here, um, at, at the bottom here, you can see the, the, the value of n at each iteration of the um, while loop is printed. So it's quite useful. Um, so here is a homework um, problem for you. So the examples I've showed so far are, are all for simple tensors, like um, a float32 tensor or an integer tensor. What if the TF print statement is used on a rack tensor or a sparse tensor? So those are the major like um, composite tensor types in TensorFlow, so you can try that. Um, by the way, I um, inserted a link to the Colab notebook um, for all the code examples in, in, in this presentation, so you can um, look at the slides, and if you, are, if you want to play with the code examples, you can use that notebook. So here's a second home, homework in, um, code. Um, you, you can use the code to see what happens if you use tf.print on a sparse tensor. Okay, so sometimes the user doesn't want to just print the value of the tensor. The user wants to programmatically um, extract the value of the tensor so they can be used for like a programmatic debugging or downstream competition. This code snip here um, shows how you can pull out um, intermediate tensors from a toy implementation of a um, TF dense layer. So um, the function originally um, returns only the final outputs of the dense layer. But maybe for some reason you want to look at the intermediate steps, like the results of the maximal or the results of the um, adding with um, a bias. So what you can do here is you can actually append these two tensors to the return values of the TF function, and then you will be able to um, access these intermediate values when you call the layer. What's slightly more complicated is if those tensors are inside control flow structures. So for instance, if you want to programmatically access the value of n at every iteration of the while loop, you can't simply just um, add n to the um, return value here. What you need to do here is to um, use tf.tensorarray and then append to that tf.tensorarray at each iteration of the, um, of the while loop. And then you will be able to see the full history of how n changes. Um, it's slightly complicated. So um, the, the TensorFlow debugger tool I will present at the end of this talk, um, hopefully will make this simpler. So having covered tensor values, um, I'm going to talk about how to debug the um, placement of ops on different devices, mainly CPUs and GPUs. Um, so it's a very frequently asked question because users want to make sure that their heavy computation is computed on the GPU, or not on the CPU. So again, if the program is running purely eagerly, then it's pretty straightforward. You can just call um, an API called tf.debugging.set lock device placement equal to. And then when those um, operations are um, executed eagerly, you will see um, lines being, being printed to the step out. For instance, um, when the multiplication um, operation here is run, you will see a line that tells you that the, um, the mall op is running on the GPU. <clears throat> and when the, um, the print statement here is running, it's actually running a print v2 op on the CPU. 
So here you can see clearly like um, where the ops are running, whether it's on CPU or GPU. And if you hold, if you have um, multiple GPUs, um, which GPU it is running on. Um, so one thing you need to know here is that it's only going to log the information when the op is um, placed for the first time. If you have the same op executing multiple times eagerly, it's not going to print it um, multiple times. So that mechanism prevents um, a flood of information to your um, stud out. So um, a more realistic scenario is where you have TF functions and graphs. So um, there, set lock device placement equal to true will still work. You will see not only the placement for the eager ops, like in the green box here, but you will also see the placement of the graph ops in the um, purple box on the bottom here. So, but, but one caveat here um, is that you need to be aware that even though the eager lines are printed to step out, currently the um, graph logs are printed to um, info log. The implication of that is that if you're doing this in a um, Jupyter notebook or collab, then you will not be able to see the um, bottom parts of the log. But um, there is actually a way in collab to capture the, the logs. You can see both. Um, it's just um, something you need to be aware of. So in the graph placement um, logs, the, the text inside the parentheses are for the op type, and the, um, the text outside the parentheses to the left of the parentheses are for the name of the op. So here are some other important things to know about um, sets lock the, um, device placement. So um, it works for both eager operations and for graph operations, but they are locked to um, different places, as I mentioned. And also be aware that the fact that an op is locked um, at graph construction time does not guarantee that the op will be executed at um, runtime. And that's because TensorFlow has its built-in graph optimization stack called Grappler. And Grappler may change the placement, or it may prune the um, op away from the graph, or it may fuse the um, op into a larger op, and so forth. I'm going to um, talk about that in a coming slide. And also be aware that um, set lock device placement currently does not work fully for um, TPUs, so it's mainly useful for debugging CPUs and uh, GPUs currently. OK, so I'm going to move on to the section about um, debugging graph structures. So um, here you, you have a um, TF function, and then how do you look at the graph um, of the compilation of that um, TF function? So the answer to that is to use the method called get concrete function on that function object. So get concrete function should be called only after that TF function is called for the first time. If you call that before the function is compiled, then um, that method will not even exist. And when you call get concrete function, you need to pass an argument. So the argument can be the same argument as you pass when you're calling the, 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 the um, function. And the reason why you need to pass that argument is because um, the same Python function can be compiled into different TF graphs, depending on the D, D types and the uh, arm shapes of the input arguments. Um, you can also pass tensor specs um, as the arguments. And the return value of get concrete function here is an object that has a graph property. The graph property is a TF graph on a Python level. To see its um, structure, you can call as graph Def um, uh, method of the graph object, and the um, return value is a text product for the graph, as shown on the right here. So the text product here is basically a repeated field of nodes. It tells you which nodes there are in the graph and how they are connected to each other. So there are properties like the name and the op and the attributes and so forth. So if you're not familiar with the um, format, you should spend some time looking at, um, at some examples because it's very um, critical, very important for TensorFlow. Um, <clears throat> but the important thing here is that for any realistic models and realistic tier functions, the size of the graph depth is going to be too big. It's not going to be friendly to like um, reading in text. And that's why um, graphical tools like TensorBoard will be important. So um, you can start TensorBoard, um, the binary. So even though um, you have, a, uh, even if you have an empty locker, um, you can still switch to the graph dashboard by using the drop down menu. And then inside the graph dashboard, you should be able to see um, a button called choose file. And you can use choose file to upload the contents of the PB text of graph. And then TensorBoard will be able to show you the structure of the graph as shown in this is, um, example here. So some important um, properties to know about TensorBoard's graph um, dashboard is that the information flow is generally from bottom to top. So the inputs are usually on the bottom. And uh, at the top, you are seeing the outputs. Um, and also TensorBoard graph visualizer will group nodes by name scope by default. So that's the reason why you often see those like big colorful boxes. And you can double click each box to expand into it. So it's quite handy for debugging large models. And uh, um, it also handles function def library correctly. So function def libraries are basically nested 
graphs. So it's used frequently in TF2, like in control flow structures. So um, like a, a TF2 while loop will contain two um, function that um, like is one for the condition of the while loop and the other for the boundary of the while loop. Those are also um, color boxes that you can double click to expand into. If you are Google internal, then you should be able to use a special import um, from Colab and uh, that will um, enable you to look at the graph inside the Colab notebook. So I find that to be slightly handier than like looking at um, graph structures in TensorFlow itself because that means I don't have to switch back and forth between two different tabs of the browser. So here's an example. So um, as we mentioned before, you can append um, variables to the return list of the TF function to access intermediate tensors. And uh, in this um, graph being visualized by a tensor board, you can see two um, extra identity nodes that correspond to the added um, return values. And that's because um, TF2 currently uses identity nodes to mark the return values of TF functions. So here's a function, here's a graph for a function that's slightly more complicated. So it involves control flow structures, including while loops and uh, if else conditions. So um, these are the boxes um, that are the function depth libraries um, that I'm Mentioned before, so you can see a box for the true branch of the if else condition. You can see another box for the false branch of the if else condition. And uh, the box here um, in red is the condition of the while loop and so forth. So if you are um, very careful and if you spend some time, you can see the correspondence between these ops in the graph and also um, in the um, operations in the Python code. But that's in um, general how to do, and it requires some um, um, expertise to see the correspondence between the graph nodes and the um, Python operators or Python functions. So that's one gap where um, the TF debugger um, tool that I'm um, that I will talk about tries to fill. So in TF debugger tool, you, you will be able to look at the graph structures and the source code um, side by side. So um, it will be easier for you to um, establish the correspondence between the Python functions of Python operators and the uh, nodes of the graph. Okay, so um, what if the function is not executing on a single device, but um, it's executing on multiple devices or multiple hosts using distribution strategy? So before I talk about that, um, I'm going to tell you about um, a useful API for mocking out um, virtual devices. So for instance, if you, want, if you have only one physical GPU on your machine and you want to do some testing or some debugging on a distribution strategy that involves four different um, GPUs, then you can use the API called set virtual device configuration to create four, um, or, um, yes, four logical GPUs. And you can use the API called the list logical device to confirm that. It's a very useful technique for testing and uh, debugging testable functions that involve multiple devices. <clears throat> so once we have set the four logical GPUs, we can use a mirror strategy to basically um, create a variable on the four GPUs, and we can um, construct a function that um, will basically call gradient tape on that variable over uh, on the four GPUs. So the function here called um, list underscore f is the function that involves the, the um, replication. And uh, you can use the get concrete function method as before to look at um, graph structure. So you can upload the graph pp text to TensorBoard to see its structure. And in the structure, you can see four boxes. And those four boxes correspond to the four GPUs. So the um, technique here um, is useful for debugging graphs in um, mirror strategies and other distribution strategies. Okay, so this slide here shows you how tf.print work in terms of the graph. So um, each time you call tf.print inside a tf function, it will append a, a pair of nodes to your graph. So the first node here will convert your tensor, the input tensor, into a string. And the second one will actually print that string into set out or info log or um, whatever output stream the, the, the print out is. Configured to. So here's a toy example for you. Um, I mean, uh, it's also available in the Colab notebook, so you can play with, um, with, with it if you're um, interested. So the question here is what happens if there is no um, return value from the function? So um, I forgot to mention that the reason why these print v2 ops get executed at runtime is because they are attached as control dependencies to the final output identity node of the graph. So these correspond to the dashed lines in the graph. So um, the homework problem is about finding out how um, the print op gets executed when the TF function does not involve a return value. So when you use tf.print, you, you need to be aware that it may inadvertently change how graph optimization works at runtime. 
So in the code snippet on the left here, we're computing um, the harmonic mean of a tensor. However, there's a line in the code which constructs an op, but the upper tensor of that op, which is the mean op, is not used in any downstream computation. Now, um, when the PF function is executed at runtime, Grappler is going to do its job and it's going to prune out that mean op. So the mean op will not actually get executed at runtime. However, if you use tf.print, you will change the optimization. Um, and uh, you're basically going to attach the um, output tensor of the mean op to the string format and the print v2, as I mentioned before. But the important thing to note here is that if you use the get concrete function method to debug the graph structure, you will always see the mean op. And that's because um, at the Python level, TensorFlow um, autograph faithfully only converts the Python function into a graph. It's not trying to do any optimization. Instead, it will hand the graph to Grappler for downstream optimization. So the question here is, how can we um, debug the um, optimized graph that are um, generated by Grappler? So that leads us to the next section. So in order to see the um, Grappler output graph, you need to use um, Bazel build. So when you um, call this, you need to specify an environment variable called tf dump. Um, graph prefix and point to any directory you have write access to. And then you have to specify the flag called the module. So that tells the meta optimizer, which is a part of Grappler, to be robust and uh, dump information to the folder. And after the um, program runs, you will see a bunch of files in the folder. So um, those are the outputs from each pass of Grappler. So Grappler um, performs graph op um, optimization um, in steps, kind of like a compiler. So the final output, um, which is usually called after meta optimizer or something, is usually the, the um, graph of interest. So it will um, tell you the structure of the graph that gets executed at runtime. So using the technique here, um, you will be able to compare the runtime graph of the two code snippets that we have seen before. So in the code snippets on the left and also the graph on the left, you see that the mean up is not present because it's pruned away by Grappler. However, in the code snippets on the right here and also the graph on the right here, you can see that the mean up is present and it feeds input into the two ops that correspond to TF print. So as you can see, the, the process here is convoluted and uh, complicated. So TF debugger will um, try to present both the Python graph and the runtime graph to you. So you don't have to do any um, Bazel build or any like um, special flags or environment variables. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about the interesting topic of step debugging. So by step debugging, I mean using a Python um, IDE or PDB to step over lines of the source code one by one. Some people prefer that over print debugging. So um, the useful API here, if you want to do step debugging, is the tf.convict um, experimental run functions eagerly. So if you call that function with the input argument true, then you're basically um, calling, you're basically telling the tf function to not compile functions into graphs. And all the code here will um, run eagerly, um, and you will be able to use either print or you can use um, step debugging, or you can use um, breakpoints in your um, favorite IDE. But one important caveat you want to keep in mind is that it works for all cases except tf.data, because tf.data um, works in a special way. It always converts Python functions into graphs before it um, runs them. So I'm going to show an example for that in an um, uh, 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 upcoming slide. This slide here shows an example um, of using VS Code to um, do step debugging on a TF function um, after you call experimental run functions in the true. However, um, if you don't call that um, function, um, I mean, if you don't call experimental run functions eagerly, or if you call um, it false, then it's not a good idea to step um, debug your um, TF function. And uh, um, for some IDEs, if you add a breakpoint, it's not even going to hit that breakpoint. And in other IDEs, um, it will um, hit that breakpoint, but the stepping pattern after that um, breakpoint will be very confusing. And uh, the reason for that has to do with um, the internal details of how autograph um, works. And I refer you to the presentation made by Dan um, Moldovan on autograph last year. And I think it's publicly available. <coughs> so understanding that, uh, it, it will probably not be too hard for you to understand why um, the strange behavior is having um, is ha happening here. So the strange behavior is that you are inserting um, print statements in both branches of the if, um, else condition, and you see that when the function is called, both um, branches get executed. 
Yeah, so the slide here shows you the, um, an example in which um, experimental run functions eagerly does not work on a map function that you pass to TF data set. So um, even if you comment out the TF function decorator for the two multi hot function, it's still going to be converted into a graph and then run um, in a graph fashion instead of running eagerly. So um, in order to debug intermediate tensors inside the function, you must use tf.print. If you do print, you're only going to print the symbolic tensors in the graph. Um, but TensorFlow debugger will also make it easy for you to debug the values inside um, a tf function passed to tf data set. OK, so, so far, um, we have been talking about how to debug low-level constructs um, of TensorFlow, including ops and tensors and the graphs. But um, many users also use high-level APIs um, like um, TFKRS, and then they also want to peek into their models. So in the um, following slides, I'm going to talk about some tools and uh, techniques available for debugging KRS models. So one very frequently asked question is, how do I get the intermediate layer output? Um, I mean, the intermediate layer activation from a TF KRS model. So one way to do it is to construct a second model. Um, which is the debug model in the example here. The second model has the same inputs as the original model, but the outputs will be the original model's output plus the outputs from the layers you're interested in. And then when you call debug model that predicts or simply call debug model as a TF function, you will be able to see not only the final output of the KRS model, but also the intermediate layer outputs. So this approach um, is, useful when to, uh, is useful to look at the final outputs of each layer. If you want to look at the intermediate tensors inside each layer, it's not that um, useful. You have to use the um, TF print methods or the other techniques mentioned in earlier parts of the presentation. And TF debugger will also make it easier for you to look at those layer internal activations. I mean, layer um, internal tensors. So one other useful thing to know when you're debugging a TF Keras model is to use the TensorBoard callback. So the TensorBoard callback, which is under the tf.keras callback's namespace, is a callback you can um, pass to your model that fits. Um, what it will do is it's going to lock um, loss functions and uh, metrics to uh, the lock there when the model is training. But for debugging purposes, it will also lock the graph of the model to the lock there. So you can just open the graph dashboard of TensorBoard and look at the graph structure. So there you see that um, the layers of the model are organized in um, those boxes that you can double click to expand. And that's thanks to the work done by the authors of TF Keras, who have been very careful in specifying the correct name scopes for each layer. But the other important um, and the useful thing to know is that the tensors are marked as those arrows that connect the layers. And if you um, look carefully, you can see those very small fonts. Those small fonts are the shapes of the tensors, to the extent known as graph construction type. So for instance, um, the dropout layer here um, outputs a two-dimensional tensor of size um, question mark times five. So the question mark is the undetermined batch dimension. OK, so having covered um, high-level API debugging, let's move on to the next section, which is about how to debug uh, NANs and, and uh, abilities in your models. So that's a very frequently occurring debugging task in TensorFlow. And it probably accounts for about half of the questions that we get asked. <clears throat> so before talking about the tools, um, I want to show you some common causes for NANs and abilities in TensorFlow models. So they can be caused by um, a lack of value clipping, like when you have a division operation in your um, TensorFlow program, like some sort of like normalization, if you forget to add an epsilon or a very small positive value to your denominator, then it's likely to run into um, abilities at runtime, especially in the face of the um, variability of input training data. And that also applies to the math law operation. And uh, sometimes events and, uh, and abilities in your TensorFlow model can be caused by bugs in your op kernels um, themselves or even in the hardware. So for this instance, we have seen a bug um, recently that um, it, it involves a batch norm kernel on TPUs outputting abilities and NANs even when the inputs are t totally valid. And uh, um, sometimes the um, NANs and abilities can be also caused by exploding gradients, especially when your learning rate is too high. So in that case, to call the um, they must mean um, just keep calm and uh, um, decrease the learning rate. And then, um, as Mehmet will tell us about, sometimes the NANs and abilities can also be caused by problematic um, training examples. So, debugging the root cause of NAN and the ability is different from the print of debugging and the graph structure debugging we have talked about in earlier parts of the presentation. And that's because um, to find the root cause of NANs and abilities, you don't know where to look. 
because um, that's exactly what you are trying to find out. You could like insert TF print statements um, to every single tensor in your model, but it's not going to work for um, like realistic models, which can include up to like tens of thousands of tensors. So that's why we need specialized tools to help you debug the, the root cause of NANs and the abilities. So I'm going to present two um, tools here. The first one is a new API. It's called tf.debugging.enablecheck.mrex. So it's a relatively new API. It um, just came into existence in TF 2.1, which was released about um, a month ago. So what the API does here is that you can simply add one line of code to your TF program. And uh, when the TF program runs, like when the model trains, it's going to check every floating type tensor in your TF program, including the eagerly computed tensors and tensors inside graphs and TF functions. And uh, as soon as any floating type tensor contains NANs or EPDB in their output, then the program will error out with a helpful error message, as the one shown on the right here. So um, the error message here contains a bunch of useful information for debugging, uh, including the name of the op, um, the, the runtime D-type and the shape of the tensor, as well as um, a stack trace. So we know that um, the stack trace from TensorFlow error messages are usually very verbose and hard to understand. And uh, the API here tries to infer or to try to guess which frames of the stack trace correspond to the user's own program. And it highlights those frames with an arrow. So um, hopefully it will be easier for you to find the important frames in the stack trace. And the API here is also general in the sense that it um, works for both forward pass and backward pass. It works for um, low level API and um, high level APIs, in including Paris. Also works if you're stuck with an uh, um, old TF1 API. And it um, should work on CPU and uh, GPU and uh, GPU. So one question you might want to ask is, what's the performance overhead of this? And it's an important question because to find the root cause of NANs and infinities, um, the overhead needs to be as low as possible. Sometimes the NANs and infinities don't happen until like a few hours or even a few days into the training. So thanks to the work of an intern, um, Anthony, the um, overhead of this API is, is, is low. So we have benchmarked um, the, the API on a bunch of, um, of models. So here's an example from the Transformer V2 model. Um, when it's training on the CPU, if you enable that check, right, then it's going to be um, about 30% overhead. Um, if, it's on, uh, if, the, if the model is training on GPU, then the overhead is slightly higher. It's about 75%, but it's not that high. So it may be even a good idea for you to turn this API on in your tests for 50 checks. So this API here is useful, but it's also limited in the sense that it only tells you what happens when the NAND or infinity happens. It tells you about the op, but it has no information about the moments or the history of the execution leading up to, the, to that moment. Okay, so what TensorFlow Debugger is can be thought of as um, basically a combined tool that will help you achieve almost all the debugging tasks that we have mentioned in earlier parts of the presentation, including look at, looking at tensor values, um, the placement of ops on devices, graph structures, um, also step debugging, um, and then numerical issues like NANs and infinities. Um, so far, we haven't put a lot of thoughts into high-level um, API support like Keras, but it's on our um, radar. <clears throat> so there are two different versions of um, TF debugger, V1 and V2. So V1 was um, a part of TF1, so it's centered around the old TF.session API. Um, so it's basically a set of wrappers for your sessions. So um, it's still available in um, TensorFlow. If you are still using TF1 APIs, um, it might be useful to you. So there are two different wrappers, the command line interface wrapper and uh, the um, TensorBoard wrapper. When you wrap the session objects, you don't have to make any other changes to your um, TensorFlow code. When session.run runs, um, it's going to um, pre present you with um, debugging information. If you use the command line interface wrapper, then session.run will basically drop into an interactive um, terminal-based program in your um, terminal. And uh, um, these screenshots show you that the, the command line interface will show you the list of tensors that are executed. You can click those tensor names to look at the details of the tensors, like um, the op placement, the values of the tensors, and so on. It will also show you um, source code and uh, um, annotate each line of the source code with the ops that are created at that line. <clears throat> um, so currently, we're working on V2 of um, TF debugger. So the, the reason why we want to invest in this, um, obviously, first, we want to bring the tool up to um, speed with the current API, which um, has no TF session, but it involves eager execution and TF function. And uh, um, also, in earlier parts of the presentation, you have seen that 
print debugging and TF prints are useful for a lot of debugging cases, but it's um, not useful in all cases, it's especially when you want to um, debug uh, um, some code deep inside the TensorFlow code base itself. So we also want to um, incorporate some lessons we learned from V1 of the tool. Um, of course, we want the tool to be general enough to work on all um, hardware types. TF debugger V1, because it predates um, TPU in TensorFlow, it um, does not work for TPU. It only works for CPU and GPU, but TF debugger V2 will work for all the major hardware types, CPUs, GPUs, and TPUs. And uh, um, secondly, we want the overhead to be as low as possible. And also we learned that the, um, there are some um, improvements that we can make, make to the UX of the front end. So TF debugger V2 in a nutshell will involve um, this process. Um, so the user has a TF program that um, he or she wants to debug. Then um, they can just insert one line call into their um, TF function and specify a locker. So the locker can be the same locker as your um, tensor board locker. And then um, if your um, tensor board is started, then you can switch to the debugger, debugger v 2 dashboard in tensor board to look at the debugging information. So the front end work is um, currently underway. So um, I've been reaching out to various people, like people at the TensorFlow team and outside TensorFlow team at Google to um, get their um, feedback. If you're interested in dog fooding this or um, telling us about your specific um, debugging use case, please reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to um, work with you to make sure that the new tool will be useful for your problem. So here are some um, UI mocks that um, UX researchers um, help us make. So it's going to be the look of the new um, debugger v2 plugin in TensorBoard. It's going to show you the execution history on the top. It's going to show you um, both eager execution of ops and the TF functions. And you can zoom into TF functions to look at the graph structure and the list of tensors that are computed inside the TF function. And the top left, left section will um, highlight important events like the generation of NANDs and infinities and repeated function compiles, which might hurt your um, performance and so forth. And more importantly, on the bottom section, you will be able to associate your graph ops with your source code or associate um, eager execution events with your source code. This will make it easier for you to find the bug, I um, mean, um, find the way back from your bug into your source code and it should speed up your uh, bug fixing process. And then finally, um, some advice. Um, so the authors of TensorFlow have do, has done a lot of work recently to improve the error messages. So next time you get an error message in TensorFlow, um, be patient and read through the error message, especially the sections labeled as in user code. It may contain some surprisingly useful information for you to debug your problems. And lastly, um, some machine learning bugs are not machine learning bugs, but they're ju just um, general programming bugs. So here is a puzzle for you to um, chew on. It's a small problem. So um, here, the user is trying to pull two listed files for the features and for the labels. And the user feeds them into a function to construct a data set. And the data set is fed into the fit call to train the model. But um, for some reason, the model training is um, not very good. The accuracy is much worse than um, expected. And uh, what's the reason for that? So it's a puzzle for you. If you're interested in the answer, reach out to me, and I will be happy to tell you the answer. But the point is that um, some bugs are just general programming bugs, not machine learning bugs, I say. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>